even if I ran away Cause your love never fails I know I still make mistakes But you have mercies for me every day And your love never fails You stay safe
work together for my good. And you make all things work together for my
feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I
God, you are our shepherd, our strong tower, Lord Jesus. You are our shepherd, God. We love you, Jesus. We praise you, God. Holy Father, Holy Jesus. Would you just say the name Jesus with me this morning? Holy Jesus. Church, he is here. Would you be desperate just like the woman with the issue of blood and just reach out and just touch the hem of his garment? Hallelujah, Jesus. every disease we thank you Jesus for your healing and strength we thank you Jesus for clear minds father we thank you God for clear minds Jesus God we come against any attacks from the enemy father that would try to come and seek to steal kill and destroy God God you are a life giver Jesus last week, you all know, most of you know, I was in the hospital. And I have in my life never been in the hospital before. It was a little bit scary riding in the back of an ambulance. A little bit scary. But while I was inside there, I have never in my life felt the peace of God, I have never in my life heard his voice more clear than I did then. In Psalms 23, you guys know I love talking about this psalm, but the portion that I want to talk about is it says in the darkest valleys, Even when I walk through the darkest valleys, I will not be afraid. For you are close. Everybody say close. Close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect me and comfort me. So then I jumped over because I'm laying there in bed just with my leg kicked up and doctors are coming in, nurses are coming in. People are coming in and they're, how are you doing? You're trying to get rest. And I'm, And the Lord showed me that I was sleeping at the bottom of the boat with Jesus. 
And there's so many here today that you're the disciple at the top of the boat. And the winds and the waves are coming. And you don't know how to handle those winds and the waves. And you're panicking, but yet the Father is down there at the bottom of the boat sleeping. And I'm calling today, and I'm saying that, child of God, take up the rest that He has given to you. Take up the promise that he has given to you. Plant yourself on a firm foundation so when the winds and the waves come, you will not be shaken, just like we sang the song. I think we go through life so many times just, yeah, okay, we're just gonna go through repetition of life. God doesn't want us to go through repetition of life. He wants to have a relationship with us. He wants us to know who we are as children of God, that we can overcome, that we can walk in his promises, that even in the, in the midst of the valley, that we can have perfect, perfect peace. Perfect peace. I was laying in bed during church last Sunday and there was cameras looking at me and I was like, I don't care. I just had my hands lifted in heaven. I was praying for you guys, every single one of you by name. And Jesus loves you so very much. And you need to be reminded of that today, how much you are chosen, called, even in the midst of the valley, even in the midst of bad circumstances, God is still there and he's still good and he loves us. He loves you so very much. If you're in the midst of the valley today and you don't feel like the shepherd is standing there with like we were talking about in this scripture, his rod and his staff protects us. You're in the midst of the valley today and you came to church today seeking for something, something more than what life could give you, something more than what this world can give you. And you knew that God is calling you here today for a reason. If that's you today. Would you just please lift your hands to heaven? Nobody looking around. Just lift your hands up like this. I just pray in Jesus' name. Father, for the spirit of peace that surpasses understanding, just to come change and rearrange, to make all things new to make all circumstances that once looked dead, to bring them back to life. They look bleak, to bring them back to life. God, to give them hope, Lord Jesus. I just even pray over that person that's watching online right now, that's just saying, I just need to have that consistency. God is calling you into a consistent relationship, not just a pattern of a few days on and then 10 days off and then a few days on and then 30 days off and then a few days on and a year off. God is calling you into that consistency right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. sing you guys just a quick song that I was singing when I was in the hospital and I want you guys to sing with me I love you Lord and I lift my voice to worship you oh
give Jesus a praise offering this morning. Would you go and just slap the hands of three people and tell them, God is real. All right, let's go ahead and make our way back for our morning tithes and offerings. So good to see everybody this beautiful Mother's Day morning. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms. We really appreciate you. We truly would not be here without you, literally. <laughs> Thank you. I was sure as if I didn't have you guys come down for morning tides and offerings. I'm sorry, guys. I didn't know I was going to be doing this today. I wouldn't have wore just sweats. Home church. Family. So you got, you got the sweat. At least I'm not wearing my tight pants. Hey, Chancho, can I borrow some sweats? Yeah. John, would you bless the offering? Thank you guys. Thank you. Aren't we blessed to have such an amazing worship team? I know that there's massive worship teams out there and, and there's huge productions, but I love the spirit of God that you guys bring. Yes. You guys just, I, I love worshiping with you guys. Can we get the house lights up? Uh, before we go into announcements, we wanted to do a in-person announcement this morning. It's something that we're really, really excited about. We are partnering 
with Forging Education. Um, if you've heard of Forging Pueblo here in town, they are making amazing strides here right in our community to bring, unite the church and make an impact in our town. And so we're partnering with Forging Education, which is a part of Forging Pueblo, to open up a homeschool enrichment program here at the church on Thursdays, starting this um, school year, this fall of 24. So we're gonna have, we have this awesome opportunity to have anywhere between 35 to 45 kids here in the church every Thursday. That could be a potentially 20 to 25 families that we get to interact with that are going to be in here. We're going to make this whole entire back area, our old offices, into the um, classrooms for them. And so we wanted to announce that to you guys so you, you know what we're working on, you know what we're doing. And also, if you are either a homeschool, we have a couple homeschool families here if you're interested in that, or you know a homeschool family you can see me after church and we're gonna be passing out. I'll be able to give you information on how to get registered with that. Guys, we have a chance to teach these kids stuff like how to build things. We're gonna do woodworking, we're gonna build sheds, we're gonna build, um, th we're gonna teach them automotives and Hannah's gonna be teaching them how to knit and crochet. You said you were gonna do it, so now it's, you're guaranteed. <laughs> but we have a chance to partner with them. So th here's just a list of some of the things that we're gonna be going through. It's an all-day thing um, from like 8 to 4 o'clock. And at the very end, it's an optional class. The coolest part about it is, is you get about 60% um, kids that stay over for that very last one from 3 to 4. We get to teach them biblical worldviews. So we get, this, we get this influx of kids into the uh, church. And then after school hours, we get to have a chance to teach them what the Bible says about life. And so we're, we just wanted to announce that to you guys. And about three weeks ago, I was up doing transition, and I was talking about programs without power. And so this is a program, but we believe that there's going to be power in this program. And so would you guys join with me in prayer this morning over this, and then start to just establish it with the power of prayer. Um, the, the program is called CREATE. And uh, we just believe God's going to do some great things for that. So would you join me in prayer? God, we are so thankful that we have a chance to partner with Forging Education, God, to make impact within our cities, God. We are so thankful that we're going to have this influx of families, this influx of kids coming into the, into the church that we're going to be able to impact and minister to and witness to and share the love of God. God, we know that this program without power is dead. So we just release the power of the Holy Spirit over this program, God. We believe that you're going to do great things in this, and you're going to use us to further your kingdom right here locally in Pueblo, God. We thank you for this opportunity. In your name we pray. Amen. Angelo, you can roll the announcements. Good morning and welcome to the Life Church, a caring and Christ-centered church. If this is your first time joining us, please fill out a visitor's card located in the seat pocket right in front of you. Be sure to join us every Tuesday at 10 a.m. here at the church offices for intercessory prayer. And leadership of TLC, be sure to come join us for our extended leadership meeting coming up Sunday, June 9th at 5.30 p.m. here at the church. And finally, ladies of TLC, be sure to join us as our Ladies Living Love Support Group starts back up starting Friday, June 7th. For more information, please see Angela or Bobby. Kids, you are now free to go to Sunday school. Now please join me in welcoming Pastor Rich Conley as he comes to bring the word. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited as well about the, uh, the homeschool uh, program that's coming here and just how uh, it's great, a great opportunity for us. But this summer we're going to be uh, doing some projects and there are, there are certain monies that are allotted to help us uh, get the place ready. So uh, over the next two uh, months or so, we're going to be rolling out some of the turf we have and 
doing some of the things to get classrooms ready and so forth. So we'll let you know how those things are going as well. All right? So everybody can pitch in. Everybody. All right. All right. Happy Mother's Day. Your moms are awesome. You know, it, uh, it's just amazing. The family is, is such a, a part of our society. I thank God for Pueblo. You know, there's places in, in our world that family is a foreign thing. And, and increasingly so, even among us, that uh, there's, there's uh, a disintegration of the family unit. We have people, but family. You know, our prayer is that this would be a family, that our church would be, that we would be a family, and that we would have that sense of family belonging and care for each other. And one of the things we do every year is on Thanksgiving Eve, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, is we'll have a Thanksgiving Eve fellowship dinner. And there are those who don't have, you know, they're, maybe they're moved or some live somewhere else, they don't have family. We always have a ton of people come on Thanksgiving Eve that, that are not even really a part of our church, but just longing for that place of connection, that place of, of fellowship. And so uh, we're grateful for the family. My title, my message on this Mother's Day is Life in the Trenches. And I'm, I know what family is like because family is not always, you know, easy. It's not, it's not always easy. I think anything valuable in life takes effort, doesn't it? To make it what it could be and not just take the easy course and let things fall apart. I think we've done that too long. Life in the trenches. You've heard that phrase before, life in the trenches or in the trenches. I'm in the trenches. And it's kind of a throwback to the olden times where they would, they would build trenches and, and they would have a battle that's going on between this army and this army and there would be these trenches and the soldiers would be down there so they didn't get hit and they'd dig out these trenches and back and forth they'd find a place of, of refuge but it wasn't always an easy place to be. Uh, life in the trenches. I looked it up online. The definition for life in the trenches online is a challenging and difficult situation that requires a lot of effort and hard work to get through a long-term struggle. And sometimes that's family. I mean, family's not always just struggle and fighting and, and heaviness. There, there's, there's such a wealth, a treasure there, that it's worth fighting for. There's such a treasure within the family that it's worth standing on our ground and not just living selfishly or bowing out or running away or, or quitting somewhere along the way. We've got, we got to stay in the trenches, you guys. And that's my challenge to us today as we meet together here in 2024. <laughs> we're, we're in the trenches whether we like it or not. And we've got to stay in the trenches. We've got to bring God in those trenches. We've got to encourage each other in those trenches. There's a culture war going on. A war for the values and the influences of our society. And the one who's heading up the other side is, is Satan himself. And he wants to destroy the family. His attack is upon the family, upon marriages, upon family relations, children growing up. You know, they might be in the same house together, but there's this division, there's this attitude. There's, I mean, it's kind of been that all the way along. You know, as kids grow up, they kind of find out who they are and, and all that. But no, it's, it's another level, you guys. I mean, it, it just, it just inf infuriates. I mean, if you were to react in the flesh, the things that are encroaching into the preciousness of our homes... If it's not a battle cry, what is it? If it's not a call for us to, to pray and to double up in our prayers, then what is it? And I want to tell you today, your prayers are powerful. Even though we don't see things always happen like right when we want them to happen. We can't 
we got to hold this line and we got to advance the cause for the sake of the family. It's a cultural battle, a culture war. A culture war is a cultural conflict between social groups and struggle for dominance of their values, beliefs, and practices, Wikipedia says. For the dominance of their values, beliefs, and practices. In other words, somebody else wants to raise your children. Moms, let the mama bear arise. Let, dad, let the dads arise. Somebody else wants to have the dominance, the influence, the, the say-so, because it affects the future. It affects everything that's coming uh, down the road. Where the family goes, so society goes. You know, I, I don't know if you remember or not, certainly on Thanksgiving, maybe Mother's Day, there would be this, this pot that mom would bring out. She's cooking food for everybody on that family gathering, and, and it would be this, this device. It's heavy metal, and it, like, locks together, right? The handle kind of slides around, and it's, it's locked. I mean, that's some serious cooking there. The pressure cooker, <laughs> It has a little thing on top, and I, I used to just be amazed by that. I'm going, what in the world? There's steam coming out, and pretty soon it's whistling and doing things, and there's a whole lot happening in the kitchen, right? So we know what the pressure cooker is like, but, you know, just, you know, mothers are in that place that sometimes life can be a pressure cooker. That pressure to conform, that pressure to succeed or you know, in the, in the face of all the voices that are out there, uh, that, the, that pressure that comes upon us in the face of uh, our own weaknesses at times and the pressure that comes in relationships. The family, you know, we're not always friendly to ourselves, let alone what comes in from the outside. We're not always friendly to ourselves and sometimes our relationships break down and uh, we got to stay in the game, you guys. We, it requires a lot of grace. We've got to tap into something that is beyond us, something bigger than us, and find that resource, that grace that God has for us. I believe the church, you know, God designed the church to be as a family as well. And the church is a tremendous resource for a family. That's, that's our heart, to be a strength for the family. I believe the church is divinely empowered to become a family ourselves, and to empower us as we gather together. And so, as Jared was, was talking about being a part-time believer, I think, I think the challenge is to really, to firstly, to realize the, the complexities that are around us, the nature of the battle that's around us, the war that's going on, to be alert and aware to that as the Holy Spirit is awakening us to the battles that are there. And secondly, to be, to be on it and not just a part-time person. I think consistency in raising children is probably the biggest thing. You're not, you're not a superstar. None of us are. But we can be consistent. We can lead. We can set an example, Right? I mean, all these things are so important for the establishing of a family and of a church. This is a house of encouragement. This is a place where we labor together and we have build relationships. We pray and we find guidance and inspiration. There is protection that comes as a result of being in the flock and the covering of the, of the great shepherd and being accountable one to another. In this house, we're, we're challenged to see beyond. We, I, I don't know. I, I think, uh, you know, in coming into a place of worship, in corp, you know, you can worship at home and should, well, we all should worship like through the day. There's just something about corporate worship that sort of opens up an understanding as we all gather together that I receive things that I really don't in any other setting and things that I carry away a courage and a boldness and a a sense of wellness, a sense of connectedness in, in, in all those things, um, a vision for life, for marriage, for the purposes of God. So the church is, is foundational for us.
with our family. Oh, we want this church to be a friend of the family. And we want families to find that strength here. I have a scripture I want to bring this morning. I believe it's a word from the Lord. A scripture that we can meditate upon and draw strength from in the face of, uh, as we face life in the trenches in this year. Psalm 31 verses 21 through 24. There's four verses here, and I want to just take uh, each verse uh, one by one and talk about, you know, what this psalm is saying to us as uh, we're not the only ones to live life in the trenches. You know, David, uh, he had his moments as well. Down through the ages, everybody's faced opposition and hardship, and we can draw strength from the experience of others, but unless we step into it, it's just, it's just hearsay and, and hope, you know, fantasy, I guess. But uh, Psalm 31, 21 says this, Praise be to the Lord, for he showed me the wonders of his love when I was in a city under siege. In my alarm, I said, I'm cut off from your sight. Yet you have heard my cry for mercy when I called to you for help. Love the Lord, all his faithful people. The Lord preserves those who are true to him. But the proud he pays back in full. Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Do you receive that today? Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. I want to I want to reflect upon some things in the New Testament as well. I think you know we have this this passage here out of Psalm 31, but I think a, a New Testament example really comes from the church at Corinth. Uh, they were in the middle of a battle. They were in the middle of conflict within themselves and they had so many things going on and we find two of Paul's letters, the longer ones, are written to the church at Corinth. God gave attention to those sayings. And I, I think it's important for us to reflect upon the, the encouragement that Paul brings, the grace that comes in his word, as in, in the words that he speaks to, to them, as well as just trying to sort out some of the, the things that were going on in their midst. I mean, if we read through First and Second Corinthians, we find that they were very, a very worldly church. There was an influence from the outside for, from their past that just sort of hung on. And, and so they were superstitious. Uh, they had selfish mindsets. They kind of followed people rather than following Jesus. You know, it's almost easier to, to follow a person in the natural than to follow Jesus who you can't see, who you, you know you can hear, but you have to listen you know, you can speak and I can hear you just naturally. But to, to go into that other aspect of what it is to be a, a child of God, it requires us to, to study. God speaks through his word. He speaks through other people, but he speaks, speaks to our spirit as well. And he gives us gifts so that we can serve him and serve one another so that we can be on track in our, in our life. So... The church of Corinth had such issues, division among them, immorality. They had bad doctrine, false teaching. They were undisciplined. They were full of opinions, but the truth was lacking in their midst. And so, you know, Paul, as he writes to them, he has to address those things, but he doesn't just slam them over the head with a bat. You know, he wants to awaken them to life in the spirit. He wants to awaken them to, to what Christ has already given to them so that they can be strong and, and survive. Just, I believe, like he wants to awaken us together today in the face of all that's coming at us, in the face of our own failures and, and the challenges of life. Awaken us to the resources that are at hand as we live out life in the trenches. 1 Corinthians 1, 4 through 9 says this, Paul says, I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. 
God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack in any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm until the end so that you will be blameless on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see, it's, life is not so much about our performance, but it's about our relationship. And God is faithful, and he's going to hold up his end of the bargain, right? And not only that, but his grace is sufficient for us because we are prone to stumble. We are prone to fail. But God is faithful, and this is what Paul is saying. God has enriched you. He's given you gifts so that you can serve each other. He's given you capacity beyond yourself. If you will tap into, you draw from that capacity that he has, then we can find ourselves being stronger than we would have been otherwise. And the, the sweetest thing of it all is just being in faith, faith, in fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so as, as we look at uh, life in the trenches, I want to go back to Psalm 31 and kind of pull on each of those verses and, uh, and see what the Lord's saying to us here this morning. The first thing is that God's provision is in the trenches. He's not indifferent to us. He has resource for us in the trenches. Psalm 31, verse 21, praise be to the Lord. For he showed me the wonders of his love when I was in a city under siege. He's, what a contrast. The wonders of his love while I was in a city under siege. And you know what, what would happen when a city was under siege? They would cut off all resources to that city. They would, they would wait them out. They would starve them out. They couldn't go out and tend to their crops or milk their cows and all the things that they needed to do. They were under siege. They were locked down. And so day by day, it just got worse and worse. I think that's what the enemy wants to do to us as well so many times is to overwhelm and to, to make us feel like we're, we're lost and that we're doomed and that things are never going to go our way. But David says, praise be to the Lord for he showed me the wonders of his love when I was in a city under siege. His love, unconditional, his devotion, his faithfulness. All that time, we, when I was in battle, when I felt alone, raising kids all by myself with the, the pressures of paying the bills, the pressures of juggling this and that, and, and you just get faced with your humanity, right? The unfailing love of Jesus is there in those trenches. He is more than enough. He is more than enough. He will supply us when our supplies are cut off. It's an unfair advantage that he gives to us. Nobody loves me like Jesus. Yeah, I love that song. Nobody loves me like Jesus. He shouldn't even love me. And we're talking the wonders of his love. Have you ever just wondered about the immensity of God's love for you when you shouldn't even be on the, on the radar? We're not worthy. But what he did in Jesus, how Jesus didn't have to die, but he came to this earth and he bore the nastiness, all of our stuff, all of our sin poured out on him. He doesn't just talk about fluffy candy cotton love, cotton candy love. It's... It's real love. It's his commitment to us. When we're in a city that's under attack, God is there with us. He's committed to us. We can find that a refuge in him in that city that he is all that we need and they're trying to wait us out, but somehow we're okay because God is in the house and he's with us and for us. God is faithful. Paul, Paul prayed in 
Ephesians, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened so that you would understand. Folks, we need to, because, you know, why, why would he have to pray that? I mean, I think <clears throat> we, we need to come to an understanding. And so many, so many, so many times we're blinded to really what is the true condition of things. All we know is what we feel. So Paul's helping his pastor our feeling. He says, I pray that your eyes may be enlightened, that you may know what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, that we would know and have access to what we need in that very hour, that we would know that what we feel and what we think is happening is not the end of the story, but he's taken us beyond. We feel it, but he feels it with us, and he's get strengthening us in the face of all that has come against us in that place. Wow. He says, I praise you, or he says, praise be to the Lord, for he showed me the wonders of his love when I was in a city under siege. And so it's okay to praise in the trenches as well. To be thankful in the trenches. We praise him, we thank him for all that he has done because praise changes the atmosphere around our lives. There's a shift in the atmosphere when the name of Jesus is lifted up and we begin to draw our attention to him, to the things above, rather than those things that are contending for our heart and our affections. We, we, we shift our focus off of ourselves onto him. Off of the evil around us or off of the schemes of the enemy on, onto him and the resources that are ours in him. Praise shifts the atmosphere. And, and what ignites praise is the Holy Spirit. You know, and as Paul was talking to the Corinthian church there in the New Testament, he was talking to them, you guys have gifts that were given by God. Holy Spirit is working among you. You're not left to yourself. He is with you. He is in you. Verse 4 says, I always thank my God for you because of the grace given to you in Christ Jesus. For in him you've been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and knowledge. And so then when we're in the trenches, we find that God's provision is there for us as well. A word of hope, a word of healing, a word of wisdom. Relationships can be complex, complicated. Our feelings, it's hard to sort them out. We need some influence, right? We don't want to be under the dominion of, of a secular, worldly, satanic mindset that's being poured out. And people are, are coming under the influence of that spell day in and day out. We are God's children. And he in us is more, more than enough. Amen. Secondly, as we live out our lives in the trenches, we, we need to be aware of the enemies from without as well as the enemies from within. So it's not always those who are out there that are our enemies. We can, you know, the world is the world. Uh, Satan is, is spoken of as being the, the God of this world. You know, he's a great deceiver and, and all those things. And so, you know, we have this outward influence, these things that hit you, but when they get on the inside, that's when the difference is made. When we start agreeing on the inside from what's happening on the outside, that's when the enemy is able to build up a stronghold or deplete your faith or to isolate you or to take you out of fellowship and all those things. When we're living life in the trenches, we need to know those things that are important for us to, to hang on to and to fight for Amen. in the midst of the battle. The verse we have is the next verse, verse 22, Psalm 31. He says, I am in my alarm, I said, I am cut off from your sight. Isn't that funny how... You know, there could be times when you just feel that God is so near and everything is so possible. And then there are those times 
It's like that shock. It, it knocks us back a bit. You're knocked off your bearings. Something happens. Somebody calls. Somebody says something. Trips your trigger. All of a sudden, you're, you're, you know, you, you were walking in the Spirit and singing to Jesus. Next thing you know, you're, you're angry. <laughs> you know, you're, you're all caught up into the drama of, of things around you. You're dealing with your humanity in that way. In my alarm, I said, I'm cut off from your sight. We need to be careful what we say when we're in the trenches. You know, that we might reflect something that's not true. You're not cut off from his sight. God sees everything. He sees us all. That's one of the, the most humbling aspects of who he is. His name that says he sees. He's the God who sees. He's the God who's there. He's the God who is for us. And in all those ways, he's, he, if we felt like somehow God didn't care for us anymore, what you're facing has gone from bad to worse just because of what's going on inside your head. The things you believe, the things you might agree with. Has he been wearing on you? He's been speaking to you maybe? I don't know. He has me. It just comes with the territory, doesn't it? It does. You learn how to fight your battle. We're not ignorant of his schemes, the Bible says. So I don't want to be ignorant. The Bible says we shouldn't be ignorant of his schemes. We should be aware of his schemes. We shouldn't fall to his traps. Sometimes we do. In my alarm, I said, I'm cut off from your sight. What things feel like and what they actually are can be two different things. And so we learn to reel in our feelings and realize that our perception is limited at best, but if we can anchor ourselves on the Word of God, if we can anchor ourselves in that relationship with Jesus, if we can lift up our eyes to Him and in that moment, as we're in the trenches, say, Lord, I know that you're with me and you're giving me strength. You are my ever-present help in the time of need. You ever prayed for help? Lord, help me like he's somewhere far off uh, and he's, he may or may not help you. But you know, there's a scripture that says he is our help in the time of need. Ever present when you feel him and when you don't. He's there. He's with us in the trenches. So I think, it, I think it's just when we get shocked, you know, by what comes against us in this life. And the things we feel that sometimes we get tunnel vision and we're just kind of, either, either that or worse, we get blinded. Yeah. Blinded to the reality of God's great love. Cut off from his sight. It gets personal sometimes. Of course, family life is not easy. I'm not going to go into things because I got kind of lots of family here, but... It's a little drama, a little this and that, you know. Uh, it's, it's hard not to fall into it sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. How, about, how about church life? Oh my gosh. What did they say? <laughs> and we get all offended, don't we? We, we can easily be offended about things and we can take offense and believe that there was some motive behind what was actually said that is detrimental to me and my family. And who's at work here? He's trying to get in there. Our enemy is so subtle in his schemes. He wants to isolate us and build up a wedge and, and then isolate us and somehow divide. And that's what was happening in the church at Corinth. They were being divided by the issues that were built up in their mind. We can learn to surrender those things to the Lord, renew our minds. Galatians 5 talks about the contrast between the deeds of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Well, there you go. If you, I don't know about you, I've still got some flesh in me. I mean, I was crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. But, I, you know, I, I don't get delivered from my old nature. I have to put it to death. 
I have to deny it, right? Otherwise, I, have, I can dream up all these things. I, I have the same capacity for sin that I've always had. Other than God's mercy shown to me and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. So I can walk in the fruit of the Spirit or I can step away from the fruit of the Spirit and, and just give in to all that junk. Don't do it. Enemies from without, enemies from within. The cross is our friend. Embrace the cross. I was crucified with Christ. That's where that old man dies. Jesus, crucify this flesh. It it brings such harm. You know, when my pride rears up or I say something unkind or, you know, that that old nature in us just brings such harm. It's, look at our society. It's just people out of, acting out of their sinful nature, prideful, enticing us, luring us. Something, something good will happen if you just give in to this and go that way. No, it's a trap. It's a trap. Fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, reverence, self-control, why did he leave that to the last? Self-control. That's, that should be number one. I mean, maybe love, joy, peace, then self-control. Huh. I think he was making a sandwich. I don't know. Fruit of the Spirit. We've, you've got the fruit of the Spirit. See, it's not the, it's, it's not the fruit of you. It's the fruit of him who lives inside of you. Because I was crucified in Christ. I got some new life inside of me. I'm connected in a new way. And God is alive inside of me, making the difference on the outside by his power. Jesus said in Luke 17, he says, it's inevitable that stumbling blocks will come. And, uh, you know, we can be a stumbling block to each other. And I think those who are closest to us have the greatest potential to cause us to stumble or to be offended with. That's the risk of relationship. Does God tell us to steer away from relationship? Yeah, you shouldn't go there. It's going to be dangerous. He said, no, come on in. The water's fine. My grace is sufficient for you. This is a place where my love is going to prevail. He helps us to tap into something, have a capacity beyond ourselves so that we're not just uh, victims of, of life in the trenches, but that we're actually winning a battle as we're in the trenches. We're not there for no reason. Our family is pressure. We're going to sow into our family life and hope and peace. We're going to speak into our children their identity. My goodness, the, the filth. You know, in our society, it seems like everything is sexualized. It's all about it. So out of balance. God has given us that gift of of sex for a reason. I mean, it's pure from his heart towards us. But it's the enemy who comes and distorts and makes it something that, that manipulates our minds and, and causes people to think differently about themselves as if that was the only thing that life was about. Come on. Something worth fighting for, you guys. <sighs> Unhealed wounds in the family. Enemies from without and enemies from within. Some of us have held on to things, certain things way too long. Oh. What Jared had in his, in his leg was an infection. I don't even know how he got it. But you don't want that infection getting in there and staying there. It'll take you out. It's poison, you know. And that's, that's how, how these things work. If the, the wounds don't get healed, if we don't take them to the cross and find that place of release and trust and stand up in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, having humbled yourself before the Lord, having been received by His grace, standing up and walking away from all that stuff, even if you have to do it day in and day out and every day, 
you walking with him because the fellowship with him is sweet and is powerful. In the Corinthian church, there was a guy named Apollos. One of the issues that they were having in Corinth was that, you know, there was people who were saying, well, I'm, I'm a Paul. Paul preaches the, the best. No, I like Paul, Apollos' version of the gospel and the way he preaches. And so people kind of gravitated to one side or, or another, and uh, it, it created divisions, you know, because people were following people, which is kind of uh, our tendency, I think, as people. We tend to follow people sometimes. But I was reading at the end of 1 Corinthians in verse chapter 16, where Paul, having talked about all these things, he talks about Apollos. Now, he was kind of in the middle of the controversy, wasn't he, Apollos? Minister of God. He didn't go in and he didn't draw attention to himself. He wasn't trying to stir something up, but he was caught up in the middle of it. And Paul says in verse 12 there in 1 Corinthians 16, but concerning our brother, Apollos, our brother, I encouraged him greatly to come to you with the brethren. And it was not at all his desire to come now. But he'll come when he has opportunity. He was still working on it. You know, sometimes the, I mean, for him to feel like he was in the midst of a controversy, like what did I do wrong? How did I hurt my, my Christian family? These people I love, these people I pray for, these people I preach to. How did, did I do something that caused this? If that's so, I don't even want to go back. Because he loved the church. And he says, you know, I'm just not ready to go back there. But he'll come. He'll come around. And there's a time when God heals and a time when God restores. And he brings us right back around and... And then in verse 13, it says, be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. Amen. I believe the Lord's healing us up, you guys. How about it? I believe the Lord's healing us up. The third thing, I've, uh, verse I want to read out of here is, I just put God is, God is for us. Psalm 31, 23 God is for us. Love the Lord, all his faithful people. The Lord preserves those who are true to him, but the proud he pays back in full. So he's, you know, it's like two camps here. There's those who love the Lord and those who are proud, those who are causing the trouble, those who are having the issues, who are bringing the pain. And, you know, God sees all of those things. You don't want to be on the wrong, in the wrong camp is all I'm saying. We want to be in the Lord's camp. We don't want to be in the camp that's causing harm or hurt to those who love God. He says the Lord preserves those who are true to him. That word preserve means to watch or to guard or to keep. You know God is able to keep you and he's watching you in the trenches. He's able to keep us in the face of all that's assaulting us in this hour. Romans 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him freely give us all things? Amen. Along with Jesus, he'll freely give us all things. Well, if you have Jesus, you've got it all. He brings it all to us. God is for us in the trenches. And finally this morning, you can prevail in the trenches. We're not victims of life. Even though we live in a hostile environment, there's a lot of things flying around. You and, you and I, because of Jesus, we're not victim, victims in this life. We should never see ourselves as victims of this life because he's made us more than conquerors in him. Greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. So there's a, there are spirits in the world that want to show dominance over our families or over our, our own soul or, or, you know, exert pressure upon our values and the things that we find to be true and precious in our lives. 
But greater is he who is in us to keep those things going, to keep that fire burning, to lift us up and to make us strong in the face of the battle, you guys. Moms, we need you. Dads, we need you. And Mother's Day is a, is a great day to honor, you know, what you did, you know, you know, my mom raised me a long time ago. I'm thankful for the foundation she laid in my life. She took me to church. They just dropped us off at Sunday school. They didn't even go to church half the time, but they took us there. <laughs> but then when we went to church, it was, I just knew it was right. I knew God was there, you know, and you lay a foundation in your children's life. You do something about what's going on rather than just going along with the flow. Our last verse here in Psalm 31. Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Be strong and take heart. Be strong and take heart. That's the word of the Lord to us today. Be strong and take heart. Be strong in the face of adversity. Be strong in the face of your own weakness. Be strong in the face of your feelings hurt. Be strong. You got to be strong. We need you strong. We need each other strong. We need, when one is weak, the other is strong. So I just can't afford to be weak all the time. I want to be strong. I'm not always strong, but when I'm weak, somebody else is strong. But God is with us and in us, and he's strengthening us from, from glory to glory, from strength to strength. He's bringing us into a greater strength in this hour. So we want to keep our focus. Life in the trenches, it's, it's real. It's, it's not always, you know, a, a just a, a statement that life is always bad or always heavy, but there are times. There are times, and it seems like we're in a time where there's, an, there's an, a concerted assault upon those things that are precious to us. And so on this Mother's Day, we're going to pray. Yeah. And we're going to stand with the family. And we're going to stand for the moms. And impart strength. Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1. He will also keep you firm until the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's his promise to us. That's his promise. He will keep you firm until the end. Let's stand together if you would. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Father. Thank you, Father. <clears throat> thank you for this house of worship. Lord, I thank you for gathering us today. Lord, we're, we are mindful that, Lord, our gathering isn't just uh, pleasantries. But, Lord, as we come together, we have an identity. We are the body of Christ. As we come together, we have an identity, Lord. You said, your word says that we are an army. Lord, as we come together, your word says as well that we are a family. And so, Lord, we just say yes and amen to how, how you have identified us. And we thank you, Lord, that you are our keeper. You're our shield about us. We thank you, Lord, that that which you have, you have begun, you will perfect until the day of your son. Lord, until that day, we entrust ourselves into your care. I pray for every mother here in this room. I speak grace and strength over you. I pray that Jesus in all of his fullness would be your portion today. I pray that you would know wisdom and strength and that you would have discernment as things roll out in your family in the face of facing up to your own, even your own limitations. That you would find your head lifted up, lifted up and your praises going up to him, to him and that Jesus taking you by the hands, taking you beyond your abilities into his abilities in you in the name of Jesus. Fortify us, Father. 
We thank you, Lord, for the blood of Christ that has saved us from our sin and has neutralized even the, the power of sin and its destructiveness in us and in our lives and in our, the sphere of our family. Whatever shape or form that takes today, Lord, we thank you that you are redeeming the time because the days are evil. We thank you, Lord, for healing us at deep levels. And so we commit ourselves to you. We pray the blood of Christ would just cover us. Thank you for enriching us and speaking into our hearts today, making us stronger, making us more like you, Lord. Show us how to serve. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We've got... Uh, We've got, let's bring the kids back out if you, if you would. We're going to have the kids come down and get flowers. Come on, guys. Where do we have the flowers? See? Yeah. Bring them up here, please. Sweet. Okay. Take a flower, take it to your mom. We want everybody to get a flower today. So there's some that your kids may not be here, but we just want you to wave your hand if you didn't get a flower. <laughs> That's awesome. So good. We need some over here, you guys. Wave back over here. Lift up your hand if you didn't get a flower. Did everybody get one? All right. All right. Well, you guys have a great Mother's Day. God, I pray that you go before us. Fill us with your love. Let joy be ours today, Lord, and strength in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.